The Gallian Foundation fosters, recognizes, and rewards excellence in scientific innovation to improve the human condition. André Malraux said once in one of his novels, Une vie humaine ne vaut rien, mais rien ne vaut une vie humaine. Human life is worth nothing, but nothing is worth a human life. All these men and women are trying to save human lives. Is there anything more noble than that? The Gallian Awards Ceremony is considered the equivalent of the Oscars Night for the innovators in the labs and awards every year Best Pharmaceutical Product, Best Biotechnology Product, Best Product for Orphan Rare Diseases, Best Medical Technology, Best Digital Health Solution, Best Incubator Accelerator Equity, Best Startup. Around the globe, the Prix Galleon is considered as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for the industry mobilizing an unrivaled network of Nobel laureates and top biomedical scientists. The Galleon Foundation manages an independent, cross-functional and geographically diverse program of events and sponsorship to brand the best of the best in new medicines and diagnostics. The Prix Galleon is a welcome initiative to stimulate creative research and promote excellence. Barack Obama the Roy Vagelos Pro Bono Humanum Award for Global Health Equity is bestowed to an individual, a company, an academic institution, or a non-governmental agency that has helped to improve the human condition through the application of biopharmaceutical science to problems of developing or underserved populations worldwide. This is the right event, on the right issue, at the right time. Staging this event in Africa is a significant statement that science and innovation are needed as much here in Africa as anywhere else. I'm particularly grateful to receive this award. The awards are among the highest honors in science and commerce because they lead to improvement in the human condition. The pre Gallian Awards recognize the world's brightest minds and most innovative companies. They are a true celebration of the hard work required to produce life-changing interventions. That is what makes us optimistic about the future. Congratulations to all of you. Make a difference. Join the Gallian Foundation. Uh, welcome to the Goyen Foundation Week of Biomedical Innovation. Uh, we're hosting these webinars here, well, not here, here in uh, New York, but uh, really our objective this week is to provide some additional content and background for our largest annual event, the, uh, the Pre Goyen U.S. Awards, uh, which will be held this Thursday in New York. Uh, we've developed this webinar series to give our Goyen nominees for Best Pharmaceutical, Best Biotech, Best MedTech, Best health, uh, Digital Health Solution, Best Startup and Accelerator uh, slash Incubator uh, investor categories, gain some greater visibility in describing their journeys of, of medical discovery. This year, the Goyen USA Awards have a record 178 nominees uh, for seven categories from nearly 158 companies covering 15 diverse therapeutic areas ranging from cancer, cardiology and neurosciences to infectious and very rare genetic diseases and vaccines. We'll be looking closely at all of these areas throughout the week, but today in the best med tech category, uh, which is uh, one of our larger ones. We have about 28 uh, different products being represented uh, across three distinct webinars. Our webinar today is an hour and will focus on cardiovascular devices and diagnostics. And ultimately, 
this will relate to the central question of what is medtech innovation doing around the urgent need for faster diagnosis and more targeted, less invasive treatments to address the growing burden of cardiovascular disease, still the world's number one killer. And I do want to point out before I introduce our, our esteemed panelists here, uh, there is a Q&A uh, section of this. So feel free, everyone in the audience, uh, there's a little Q&A button down at the bottom by record, share screen and all that. Uh, feel free to post questions in there throughout the presentation. Uh, now that we've gotten a little housekeeping out of the way, uh, let me introduce our panelists. So today uh, we have the honor of being joined by uh, Ishu Rao, uh, Medical Director for Impulse Dynamics, uh, Lexen uh, Siramani, Development at Edwards Life Sciences, and Matt Thompson, CEO and President of Endologics, LLC. Uh, fellas, I'd like to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience today. Uh, Lexen, would you mind going first and uh, giving us just a, a minute about yourself? Oh, you're on mute. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I'm Alexis Herman. I'm the Senior Vice President of R&D for Edwards Life Sciences. We are the leading company designing artificial heart valves. The company is actually 65 years old. And the first artificial heart valve in collaboration between engineers and doctors um, was invented at Edwards. So it's a great honor for me to be here today and talk about two of the nominations uh, that will that are two heart valves for the treatment of aortic stenosis and pulmonic stenosis in uh, in younger patients. Fantastic, uh, Ishu, would you mind uh, going next, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Ishu Rao. I'm the medical director for Impulse Dynamics. Impulse Dynamics is uh, the company that makes the Optimizer Smart Mini system for delivery of cardiac contractility modulation therapy for patients with moderate to severe heart failure. Um, we've been in existence for over two decades, um, working continuously on uh, this one problem with this one therapy, uh, develop it, developing uh, the device to treat it as effectively um, as possible for the 65 million patients around the world that have heart failure. Um, very glad to be here. Thank you for having us and uh, for the nomination. Fantastic. And Matt, would you mind bringing us home? Sure. And it's a pleasure to join you. Um, great privilege to be here. So uh, my name's Matt Thompson. I'm the president and CEO of Endologics LLC. Uh, we're in Irvine, California, Santa Rosa, California, and Milpitas, California. And uh, I'm out of the Irvine office, which is probably two or three miles away from where Laxon is. So a little bit of a congregation in Southern California. Uh, my background's um, initially as a physician. Um, I was a vascular surgeon in the United Kingdom, Robert, not far from you, uh, for about 20 years and moved to California in 2016 to join Endologics as the chief medical officer. Endologics is a company that's really specialized in disruptive innovation in the peripheral vascular field, predominantly treating patients with abdominal aortic aneurysms up until 2020. Um, at that time, we underwent a public to private transition and actually broadened our product portfolio. And obviously here today to talk about the detour system, uh, which is to treat patients with uh, lower limb ischemia through atherosclerosis. So great pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Thank you all for, for the introductions. Uh, as a reminder to the audience, there are uh, brief statements that have been prepared by each of the panelists' organizations, uh, which you guys can access at any time. So audience, feel free to do your homework at home. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, your devices a little bit. And I wanted to start off uh, with a, a broad question, and let's uh, keep this fairly conversational for, for today if we can. Um, but I, I'd like to understand a little bit about why did each of your organizations choose to focus on these uh, indications, these disease states uh, associated with your products? What was the, the unmet medical need that was prompting uh, the, the effort there? Uh, issue, if there's uh, something maybe you want to kick us off with? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, you know, heart failure is a 
is a global problem that affects 65 million people. And despite advances in medical therapy, device therapy, um, all sorts of innovations, we still see a 50% mortality rate at five years um, when diagnosed with this with this condition. So it's a um, it's a large problem, still number one cause of death. Um, it's an unmet, uh, there's an unmet need. And I think one of the things that we find is that, um, you know, patients with heart failure, uh, we found ways to have them live longer, right? Um, the defibrillator was invented in 1980, fantastic device. I was a practicing electrophysiologist, put thousands of them in um, and helped a lot of patients, but they don't feel better. And um, our goal with Impulse Dynamics with the, the, the optimizer system of devices was really Let's get these patients living better, not just longer. And that's where our journey began 25 years ago or so um, and continues to this day. And in the spirit of um, some of the things you talked about and some of the, the goals of, um, of, of technology companies um, in the era we live in, now it's getting the, the, the technology, developing the therapy, getting the technology, delivering it to patients, and then delivering it better and making it better for them. So it's really uh, less impactful for their lives. So that's, that, was, that was our motivation back then. It continues to this day. That's fantastic. M Matt, I'd be curious to hear a little bit about uh, sort of your perspective on this for, for your products as well. And then Laksa, uh, we'll, we'll kick it to you as well. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks. I mean, so the patient population that we chose to address with the detour are patients who've got lower limb peripheral vascular disease. Um, that's really resonant for me as a vascular surgeon. I was treating these folks for 30 years and thought I had a clear idea of where the clinical unmet need was. So Peripheral vascular disease affects, I don't know, probably about 8 million folks uh, in the US. Uh, we know it's a disease that is increasing in incidence and prevalence at the moment with higher rates of obesity, metabolic syndrome and diabetes. So it's a clear area uh, where patients are going to benefit from new innovative and disruptive therapies. Um, obviously, there's been a huge amount of progress in the treatment of patients with PVD in the last 10 years with um, medications becoming available that slightly modify the disease and also all of the disruptive endovascular therapies that we've all heard of, such as balloon angioplasty, drug eluting balloons, drug eluting stents, atherectomy, um, lithoplasty, and the various other therapies that are available. Um, we chose to focus on a subset of those patients who have long blockages in their femoral artery, so between the groin and their knee. Um, we know that patients who have atheroma in that area, and particularly those who have relatively short blockages, do very well um, with existing endovascular techniques. But as the blockage gets longer and longer, um, then those techniques tend not to work quite as well. And whilst patients might get some temporary relief. Their symptoms often come back within a year. Um, at the moment, a lot of those patients get open surgery, um, and that's a journey all of us have been through, uh, the transition of large open operations to more minimally invasive procedures. And it's that group of patients that we wanted to address with the detour system. Um, so Endologix is a company that really prides itself uh, on trying to treat patients with unmet clinical needs, with innovative therapies, always within the interventional vascular space and always backed with clinical evidence. So our challenge really was to try and transition patients who have open surgery at the moment called femoropopliteal bypass to the detour procedure, which is an endovascular technology that allows a bypass procedure to be performed, but with the advantages of a minimally invasive approach as opposed to a surgical approach. Um, so we think the clinical need um, is huge here. Um, we think there's around 100,000 patients in the US um, who have treatments on an annual basis for blockages that are longer than 20 centimeters in length and our therapy is particularly designed, ideally, uh, for that patient population. So increasing disease prevalence, uh, very common disease, very disabling for patients, and 
our aim was to try and offer these patients a minimally invasive solution to their problem and therefore improve their quality of life. Outstanding. That that was such a great overview. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Lexan, I'd love to hear the Edwards perspective on this as well as a, a big leader in the space. Yeah, Robert. So we've been at it for 65 years and invented the first artificial heart valve and now taken on the huge challenge of finding non-invasive structural heart problems. And, and this morning, this afternoon, I'm going to tell you about two of these uh, challenges that my team has particularly taken on. And, and one area is severe aortic stenosis. It's one of the nastiest diseases out there in the Western world. Uh, 50% mortality at two years. So half the patients that are diagnosed with severe aortic stenosis will, will die in two years if they're not treated. So what is the treatment method right now? Um, it used to be open heart surgery. You went in, you were under anesthesia, you have a, a heart lung bypass machine hooked up onto you, your heart, your chest is cracked open, your, your heart is stopped, your diseased heart valve is taken out and replaced with a bioprosthetic heart valve and you're put back together and, and you, you spend several days in the intensive care unit, you're in the ward, and for most of these elderly patients, because aortic stenosis is a disease of old age, we are all going to suffer from it at, at some point or another to some degree, right? So these patients don't even get a chance to go home. They go to a, a nursing care facility for a couple of months, and then, then they go home. Many of those patients can't even tolerate open heart surgery, so they don't get treated. They are the, they are the type of patients who, who the doctor says, you know, go home, hug your family, spend some time with them and and try to live out the best of your life. So what we came up with, the transcatheter heart valve system where we can crimp a valve to a very low profile, we can thread it through the femoral artery in the in the leg. So, you know, they, there are no nerves that you can feel things as, as a valve is going through your femoral artery. The patient is wide awake, the heart is beating and we can replace a heart valve. So this, in general, these heart valves can be, these procedures are done in 45 minutes. Uh, the fastest one I've seen was 12 minutes from the insertion of the sheath to taking the sheath out. And uh, I mean, my boss always tells me, you can't, you can't get your teeth cleaned that quickly or get an oil change done in your car, but you can get your heart valve replaced. So it's a huge impact because when you have something that is non-invasive, there's a much larger patient population can be treated. And now this has become the standard of care for the treatment of, of uh, low risk for surgery in these severe aortic patients. Now, if I might take a couple of minutes, I'll tell you about the other product that we are nominated here. Uh, it's a pulmonic Altera pre stent, <clears throat> completely different disease state and a type of patient. These are congenital heart patients. These are patients who were born with, uh, with severe problems uh, structurally in their in their heart. And so by the time they're 16 years old, they, they've gone through three, four open heart surgeries. Maybe their first surgery was when they're, when they are six days old. And at this point, you know, there are procedures like the Ross procedure where the pulmonic valve is taken and put in the aortic location and you leave a fully regurgitated and open uh, pulmonic valve. And the pulmonic valve is what feeds the, the blood into the lungs. So, you know, these, these patients, really know at one some point or another that they are going to need another open heart surgery. And even the surgeons really don't want to do a fourth open heart surgery. So again, we came up with a Altera, it's a nitinol, nickel titanium self-expanding stent system to go into the pulmonic valve. And these patients are under general anesthesia. And, and again, in, 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 in less than an hour, we can replace their heart valve. And the most beautiful thing about this product is that the patient can go home the next day. They're walking, they're, they're living a, an amazing life. So two remarkable uh, products uh, that we've been nominated to, nominated for. That's fantastic, Laksan. And I think uh, I'm probably not the only person listening that's going to try and use that uh, 12 minutes or less line on his mechanic next time he has to go in. So uh, thank you for that one. <laughs> um, I, we've heard a lot of really great stuff already about these products and, and the impacts that they're having on patients. Uh, I, I'd like to ask a, another question, uh, a little bit more around um, the impact, right, that that you guys are citing uh, for these clinical outcomes. And I know we kind of touched on it a little bit, 
but uh, specifically with the clinicians, right? I know the, the patient populations, it sounds like are really responding well. Would love to hear a little bit more about that too, but uh, uh, we'll kick it off. Uh, Matt, do you maybe want to uh, get us going on this one? Yeah, I mean, so the, the question's kind of, you know, how, how does your product impact patients? How does it impact clinical outcomes? And yeah. I always kind of try and divide that into a couple of different categories, really. I, I think there are the clinical outcomes that we measure for clinical trials, often for regulatory approvals, um, and talking to the medical profession about. And in terms of the detour system, uh, what we're talking about is how do you get flow uh, through a blocked artery, around a blocked artery to the lower leg. So we look at outcomes such as um, major adverse events um, during and immediately after the procedure. You look at patency rates, so how successfully is the blood flow, th uh, blood flow throwing through the leg. Um, and, you know, as we measure those in clinical trials, um, we see nice positive outcomes for the detailed procedure. So a little bit like Laxton just described, what we're trying to do with this procedure is transition from an open surgical procedure to an endovascular methodology. So we're looking at length of stay, can the patient be awake during the procedure? How long does the procedure take? How quickly can the patient be discharged home and like most endovascular procedures we're seeing a nice trajectory there that reduces length of stay from an open femoropopteal bypass which is often five to eight days down to an outpatient procedure uh, we're seeing a significant reduction in major adverse events and hospital readmissions um, and then in the longer term um, our IDE trial has data out to a couple of years we show patency rates, so the graph staying open um, to the same extent that open surgery does. So I think there's those, those traditional outcomes and methodologies that we track during clinical trials, during regulatory approvals. Um, but I think also um, as a medical uh, technology company, uh, we need to understand the effect on the patient as well. Um, so we pay a lot of attention to patient reported outcomes. Um, because they're really the fundamental outcomes that are noticed by the patient and their family. Um, for patients with lower limb disease, uh, in terms of blockages to their femoral artery, that's often manifest by difficulty in walking, uh, by pain, cramp-like pain in the muscles on walking, and in more severe cases can result in disadvantageous outcomes like ulceration of the foot gangrene and eventually amputation. Um, so we pay a lot of attention to does the patient improve for themselves after the procedure? Uh, can they walk further without pain? Uh, can they undertake their normal activities or stress activities like playing half a round of golf? Um, and generally, we've seen very significant improvements in patient outcomes. Uh, in terms of what patients report to us. And I think as you know, medical device companies, we, we have to pay attention to the functional status of the patients as well as the traditional clinical outcomes that we track um, during the regulatory process. Um, just maybe to, to touch on your, your last point, clinician and patient response to the product. So um, great response uh, for patients. Um, love getting in hospital, getting out often the same day um, with a procedure and a process that works nicely in comparison to an open surgical procedure where the length of stay is much longer and obviously the recovery is measured in months rather than days or weeks. And a huge amount of physician advocacy uh, for our product. We're very early uh, in our product launch. We don't have years of experience behind us, but um, great attractiveness of the therapy to the vascular surgeons, the cardiologists and interventionalists that are doing this procedure at the moment. Fantastic, Matt, thank you for that. Um, Luxon, would you mind sharing uh, your perspective on, on this as well? I know you touched on a, a decent amount of it in, in the previous response, but I'd love to, to hear a little bit more if you don't mind. It, it's a huge impact, Robert. I'm here in San Francisco at the TCT conference, which is the largest cardiovascular conference in the world. Uh, 10,000 attendees, and we just presented the five-year outcomes for transcatheter heart valve replacement. 
which is on par with surgery. So, you know, clearly it shows that the, this amazing outcomes in terms of you can get your heart valve replaced without having open heart surgery, which really opens up this for a, a larger population of patients that are no, that normally would not get uh, or, on, or would not be suitable for surgery. And when you look at the outcomes that were presented yesterday, you know, your mortality is less than 1%, stroke is less than 1%, uh, a discharge at, at 1.7 days, you get to go home. And uh, and when you look at the quality of life measures, uh, the, you know, when we started this uh, 15 years ago, patients were, you know, the type of patients that we treated were the inoperable patients. And they, and they told us, look, I just want to live... Uh, until Christmas, can you get me there? And and then then uh, with the, the the second and third generation products, uh, they, they were they were oh I want to live a few years. I want to get to the point of my granddaughter's graduation. I, there's a wedding I want to go to. And now we are at a point where where these type of patients are. That's not what they are looking for. They want to go hiking in the in the forest of Utah. They, they, there is a bike ride they want to do. Uh, playing the back nine is not enough. They want to play full 18 holes of golf and they've got travel plans to Europe and river cruises. And so there's a significant patient impact uh, that these products have. And uh, and I think, and, and I'm speaking as an engineer, not as a physician here. It is also remarkable that Edwards put so much of effort into clinical evidence. Over 10,000 patients are being tracked that have tra transcathodic heart valves. And uh, this year, at, by the before the end of this year, I think we're going to announce that we have treated over a million patients with a balloon expandable sapien uh, family of valves. Uh, but the clinical ev evidence, the partner trials, these are groundbreaking trials that are being discussed. And uh, we've got eight New England Heart Journal uh, of Medicine uh, publications, and including one uh, yesterday. And, uh, and these are groundbreaking clinical trials are being presented. So clinical outcomes is a huge piece because they definitely have such an impact on patients and just in, in tackling this problem of severe aortic stenosis. That disease stays, I tell you what, we've taken on that challenge. Yeah. We, are, we, are just, we are not chipping away, we're just giving it a good thrashing, I think. Love to hear that. That's fantastic. Uh, Yishu, uh, same question as, as the other two fellas, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so it's interesting in listening to um, to Matt and Lex, and I was thinking, you know, the, those technologies are fantastic. They've taken very morbid surgical procedures and made them a one night stay in the hospital, if that right. Um, and I was thinking, how does that apply to our technology? And it actually really, in a lot of ways, doesn't because our patients are patients that didn't have the option of a surgical procedure or any other procedure. So the patients that, 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 that we are treating, um, these are patients that really have no other options. Their only option was um, sort of the, 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 the conversation that Laxon intimated that physicians will have with patients when there's nothing else to do is go home, get your affairs in order and, um, you know, and, and live out your life. And, and it's, you know, really just accept that you're in a downward spiral. You're not going to have the ability to, to do things like forget about going on a hike for, you can't go to the grocery store. You can barely walk across your living room. That's the patients that we had, and they really had no other options. So when we were able to bring this technology to market in 2019, when we got FDA approval, um, we were, we were gratified as a company, um, really everyone in the company, we share the patient stories, uh, the beginning of almost all of the calls we do within the company because they are so powerful. And that's the impact um, that we see with the patients. Um, we have our clinical data, you know, mirrors very much what we saw with CRT 20 years ago. CRT is cardiac resynchronization therapy. It was the first device-based implantable um, cardiac rhythm therapy that could make patients' heart failure symptoms improve. And it was dramatic in the effect it had when the patient was the right patient and when the patient responded. The problem there is that as we have gone through the last two decades, we find that really finding that right patient, there's a very uh, prescribed subset of patients that respond to CRT, which leaves a lot of patients that don't have that option we showed with our clinical trials looking at things like 
peak VO2 difference, which is a very objective measure of, um, of cardiovascular fitness. Um, we looked at um, quality of life scores, six minute walk, um, NYHA improvement, and showed, com- uh, showed results that were very similar at least as good as what we saw in the CRT trials um, 20 years ago, which gave us a lot of confidence that patients would benefit. What have we seen in the few years, four years since commercialization of the product? Um, We've implanted historically over 9,000 devices. We see 80% of our patients improve. That means they go from class three heart failure to at least class two heart failure. And half of that 80% go to class one heart failure. So we're back to the hiking analogy. Now we're not just gro- shopping in our grocery stores. We're not just checking our mail. We're not just going for a walk with the dog. We're hiking in the mountains. In fact, we have several patients that send us videos. They um, they have our our CEO is very, very open with um, with our patients and providers, and they will directly send videos of themselves doing these things. And, and, and then he will in turn share that with the company because there is no greater driver for us um, than seeing that response. Um, I said 80% of patients improve that 20% actually stabilize. So really it helps all the heart failure patients. This is what we've seen in our clinical trials. Beyond that, in um, in uh, European registry, we showed about a 70% reduction in cardiovascular and heart failure hospitalizations, which is an absolutely stunning number. And we're going through the process right now of doing the randomized clinical trials um, to, to, to show that, um, to validate that yet again. Um, and then one of the other things that patients tell us is one of the greatest impacts of what we've done. Because you have to consider a lot of these patients have other devices like defibrillators, which I said earlier, you know, the defibrillator was a fantastic device. Um, I put a ton of them in when I was in practice and it saves people's lives. But one of the downsides is it's a battery driven device. So every five to eight years, you've got to replace it. Um, When we, you know, when we were going through the development process, we recognized that because of the way we deliver therapy through a pulse generator with two leads delivered or placed in the ventricle, similar to pacemaker in morbidity and in complication rates and procedure times, patients go home the same day and everything. Big difference is we deliver a lot more energy. So we didn't want patients to have to come in to have battery changes every two years, three years, even five years we developed a rechargeable battery that lasts 20 years. So now you take a 60 year old heart failure patient, you put this device in, it is a one and done type of procedure. They don't have to worry about the specter of having to come back and have the device replaced one or two or three times. They can go about their life and forget they ever had the device put in, except for the fact that now they can take those hikes and things like that. And that part of it, I think, is as impactful as the therapy. It's also the release from the tether of follow-ups and and, 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 um, uh, the replacement procedures, et cetera. The clinicians have responded in kind as well. Um, again, we get we get these videos, we get these um, these testimonial videos. We have um, physicians calling us out of the blue. I'm the medical director. I know you know a fair number of them um, personally, and they'll call me up and they'll they'll say, "I've not seen this before. Even with CRT, I've not seen this predictability." of response. And um, I think, you know, when you when you look at like some of these, ther- like, like Laxon, when you guys take a stenotic aorta valve and open it up, you know, patients are going to feel better right away. And Matt, when you guys open that femoral artery that's been, you know, that, that's been occluded, you know, the patients are going to feel better. We have that same response. And I think that these, all of these things, while objectively impactful, um, we've got the clinical evidence, we've got longevity, we've got um, 9,000 patients, but I'll tell you the thing that kind of the, the sentiment that roams around in the halls is the individual patient feeling better. There is absolutely no bigger impact, um, than that. So we're, we're grateful to be able to be part of their journey. That's outstanding issue. And actually I'd like to, to stay on you for a moment, if, if you don't mind being, uh, uh answering this next question as sure. well. I think you touched on uh, some of these elements, and I, I think this group is a very lifelong learner-oriented group. So 
I want to talk about some of the lessons and the, the things that you've learned uh, as a result of the work that you have been doing. Right. So what are some of the challenges that came up for the company in transitioning from early proof of concept all the way to, to human testing? I know you mentioned a tough patient population in general, right? What, what were yeah. some of those other pieces? Yeah, I mean, our journey has really been a stem to stern journey. Um, our founder, Professor Shlomo Benheim, is um, a, he's an electrophysiologist, but also a um a visionary of, of the nth magnitude. And he was in the electrophysiology lab and noticed something that I'm telling you, I've been in a bunch of electrophysiology labs. I know a lot of electrophysiologists, all of us would have walked away and said, oh, that's a weird thing. He took that weird thing and investigated it further and further and further. So when I say stem to stern, I mean, he took one, literally one cardiac beat, investigated it further, built bench testing models for that. So you can start kind of, I mean, without even knowing the details of it, you can probably sort in your mind know like what the challenges are along the way. Um, I think that the biggest ones were um, tenacity needed by the early investigators to not um, not give up on it, um, to keep building the, the body of evidence. Um, I think as we got into the clinical trials, I think one of the biggest things, one of the biggest things was that we realized we have to deliver a lot of electrical energy through a pacemaker device. I mean, the, the implantation procedure is identical to dual chamber pacemaker implantation, but the technology within the device is very different. We have to deliver so much more energy. We had to come up with a way to do that that wouldn't impact the patient negatively. So it's one thing to say, hey, I can I can treat your heart failure. You're going to feel great. But every two years, you're going to have to have this battery replaced. That's that for us was not that was a non-starter. We needed to do something to help the patients. And we invent we, we developed a rechargeable battery for this. Um, and I think that was one of the big challenges was a purely technological piece. Um, from then it was, you know, it's it's probably the thing that that all technology and, and device and even pharmaceutical um, companies face is that when you're doing the clinical trials, you're um, you're doing it in a shifting landscape, right? I mean, we start a trial and then a new medication comes out. Now you've got to show that your your device is um, better than not what you started with, but what you end what what it ended with. What was the what was the um, the landscape of treatment uh, at the finish line? So that um, and that's just a I think a regular challenge for for all of us. Um, and then I think it's um, transitioning from the mindset of a scientist to the mindset of a pragmatist, which involves regulatory pieces, regulatory hurdles, reimbursement hurdles. Um, and I would say that, you know, our leadership group has done a phenomenal job of that, our, um, our, uh, our founder, our board. Um, but I think that if I was um, if I was talking to a, a, a new startup, I would tell them, look at the big picture because you're going to start taking a step here and a step there and a step there. Look at where the finish line is and start planning for the finish line. And you always have to plan to win because you got to win. I mean, that's 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 the bottom line. I'd like to give the other panelists a, a moment to react uh, if there's anything uh, that was interesting in what you should share. Uh, or any similar challenges either of you have also faced? Issue, I mean, congratulations to you and your team. That's remarkable. I think coming up with a battery that'll last 20 years, that's, that's an incredible achievement. Um, for us, if you can imagine, um, 20 years ago, the gold standard for severe aortic valve replacement was open heart surgery. And not everybody got that surgery, but those who got it, had really good outcomes, right? But the, on, the other, on the flip side, if when things went badly, things went really bad. So turn the clock back to what we were trying to do. We were trying to imagine a procedure that where the patient is wide awake, they come in in the morning, they, are, they go to a hybrid OR, the heart is beating, a valve is threaded through the leg using fluoroscopy and echo and, and the valve is deployed, you've got great hemodynamic function, you have a valve that, that'll last 10 plus to 10 to 20 years and you go home the next day. That sounds like a really crazy vision. 
but we knew that there was a significant unmet clinical need and we knew, knew that the impact to patients was going to be really huge. So if there's one takeaway, never ever give up when you find something like this. Just keep attacking. The very first patients that we treated were inoperable patients. They were the worst of the worst. But these are the patients who would go home and die, and they were given a second chance. And now we are at a point we are treating low-risk patients. And something re very remarkable about um, Edwards Life Sciences is not only do we do clinical studies evaluating devices, but we are doing two, two groundbreaking clinical studies uh, trying to get a better understanding of, of aortic stenosis. So what happens if you have severe aortic syn uh, stenosis, but you're asymptomatic, right? Shouldn't you be treated? Because if you had, if you, if you had uh, uh, cancer, your, your, your doctor is not going to tell you, you know what, it hasn't metastasized yet. Let's wait till you get to stage four before we, we start treatment. And the same thing, like if you had a blocked coronary, your doctor is not going to say, let's wait till, we, till you have a heart attack before we put a stent in. So those were significant challenges. Then you can imagine at that time, uh, new technologies had to be invented. How do you get a heart valve that, that was that small? How do you how do, you do the measurements non-invasively? New braided catheters, steerable catheters had to be invented. How do you manage these patients before and after care? So there were significant challenges and we never gave up. And, uh, and we continue to take a look at uh, this disease state. And we've iterated, we've gone from Sapien to Sapien XT to Sapien 3, Sapien 3 Ultra, Ultra Resilia, which is being nominated. And there's a couple of more in the works as well for future generations. But this, this, point of iterating the product, making it improve, making those leaps, coming up with new technologies and discovering the face of the earth with some of the smartest people that we can find. And not just in engineering, regulatory strategies had to be changed. Clinical clinical protocols were written that that have never been written before. And so the, you know, it takes, uh, it takes a, a small city, not just a village to get one of these products on the market. Uh, but you know the impact, and and when you bring a group of like-minded people who share that same vision, who believe in it, uh, then I think we could do great things. Matt, I'd love your perspective as well. Yeah, let me react to you. I think one of the <clears throat> truest things you said there is you got to look at the whole picture from thirty thousand feet. Um, I think once you start breaking a device down from concept to inception to manufacture to trials to final approval and then clinical commercialization it looks such a daunting task you got to have the overall vision for what the product can do and how it's going to be used in clinical practice and how it's going to change people's lives so i i couldn't agree more with you the the overall vision and understanding what that journey is going to be like is is so important uh, Lax and I also, you know, absolutely agree with everything you've said about product iteration, device design, etc. I I want to highlight just kind of three areas really that um, I think we all in the medical device industry owe a sense of gratitude to. Um, firstly, is the clinicians and the patients who undergo the clinical trials. That is such a heavy lift for the physicians for the facilities and actually for the patients who are brave enough and strong enough to accept a brand new technology when there are other existing technologies that they could undergo, but maybe not with the same degree of efficacy. Um, one of the challenges um, we actually faced um, when we were doing our IDE study with the detour study was COVID. Um, we were treating patients uh, in hospital uh, at the start of the IDE trial and as COVID hit the hospitals filled up and just an astonishing response from the clinical community and the patient community to um, change trial sites from in hospitals to OBLs to find a way of getting important research done and you know I think we all owe a degree of gratitude and a shout out for the clinicians, the research coordinators, uh, the teams that do clinical research. That's always uh, such a high barrier in bringing any medical device into commercial practice that 
Um, you know, I think it often goes uh, unnoted, but it's a very significant lift. Um, the other aspect that is always interesting to talk about is when we go back to the initial question of this webinar is what does med tech need to get devices um, to treat innovative diseases? I mean, it's the regulatory environment as well. Um, we know that regulatory environments change um, throughout the world. Um, the European Union has been through a big change recently with uh, the inception of EU MDR. But I think a uh, shout out to the FDA um, is needed here. FDA's, I think, um, responded very well to the need to get devices through more quickly with um, their early feasibility studies, with breakthrough device designation, with the ability um, with innovative and disruptive devices to give them a classification that allows them to move through the regulatory process with a clarity. Um, so again, a, a favourable regulatory environment is always going to be a challenge uh, for medical device technology. Uh, and I think we're in a, in a good place at the moment. And then finally, um, one aspect that we don't often talk about um, because it varies so much from country to country worldwide is the reimbursement environment as well. Um, it's absolutely fine doing a trial and getting a product approved, but if you're going to commercialize that product and generate enough capital to iterate the design to make further disruptive innovations, um, you've got to get reimbursement. And again, um, working with CMS, the providers, the private payers, I think is a challenge uh, for most medical device companies as we uh, bring these innovations to market. So um, reiterate everything that Isha and Lakshan said, but I think there, those are three components as well that are often forgotten in that journey. Fantastic. Uh, this is such great perspective, gentlemen. Um, I want to remind the audience real quick because I'm uh, looking at time and uh, really flies when you're having fun. So folks, please put uh, questions in the Q&A if you have any. Um, we do have uh, one question, a uh, little bit broad that I can ask this group here, uh, if there's anyone uh, that has just been waiting for the invitation to add their questions in. So uh, I'd like to, to turn our attention a little bit more to the future now, right? We've talked about a lot of the things that we've uh, been doing in the past and what we're currently doing to support patients. But a little bit more broadly, uh, technology is changing rapidly. AI is changing the face of a lot of different aspects of the world. A um, lot of new technologies are being uh, adopted, incorporated. Uh, I, I'd love to get your perspective on the contributions that your organizations intend to make uh, over the next few years to continue to fight cardiovascular disease, but also uh, what's exciting to you about what can come right down, down the line in the next few years. Uh, I'll open it up broadly. Anyone that would like to, to kick us off on the topic? Um, I'll jump in. Um, so our, you know, we have a an interesting, I think, technology because historically implantable cardiac devices have iterated and, you know, and, and move forward. The, the easy answer for us is make them smaller, make them last longer, um, put less hardware in the heart. Right. And to that end, actually, we are in the middle of a pretty groundbreaking trial. We combined a defibrillator with our CCM delivery device into one device, two leads, takes as much time to implant as a traditional defibrillator. We're in the clinical trial for that. And that is a device that will deliver both those therapies. So now instead of devices on both sides of your chest, patients can have one device. And this device also will have the same technology that currently gives us 20 years of labeled longevity on our current product. So again, defibrillators typically last five to eight years. This one, we expect to last something more in line with our mini device, which lasts 20 years. That's the easy answer kind of from where we are. And you know, if you look at our good downstairs, look at our product development whiteboard, you can probably see kind of that and then the next, you know, kind of iterations on that. I think one of the most exciting things, and 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 I, I would say if we're doing this, it's, you know, years away. I think the auto feedback from physiology to reprogramming devices on the fly, and I'm speaking very much in the cardio, you know, the, the cardiac implantable, um, you know, uh, rhythm management kind of uh, arena. I think that's very interesting. Like, can can you have a device that 
knows what the patient is doing, what their blood pressure is, their heart rate is, can it automatically reprogram? There are some, you know, aspects that the devices do right now, but I think that auto feedback kind of thing, it's sort of, um, I think that where you, you almost create um, a, a, a self-sufficient system within, I think that would be really interesting, not just in our world, but in think about everything, you know, you think about diabetes management, you think about blood pressure management, you think about, um, you know, just about anything. I think, I think that and AI feeds into that to my, um, in, in my view, pretty heavily. I'd be interested in seeing, hearing what these gentlemen have to say. I, I think, I think the future is bright. I think the, I believe that the future is incredibly exciting. Uh, we just got approval in Europe for the Evoke Transcatheter map valve for the treatment of uh, tricuspid disease, which is a tremendously untreated uh, disease state. And we have multiple programs for the treatment of mitral uh, valve disease in repair and replacement. Uh, and we continue to innovate, we're a very innova innovation driven company. And in our critical care division, um, we are using AI and predictive algorithms. For example, a patient uh, who who is going into hypertension. Usually, they go into hypertension, and 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 the physicians react to that and treat that patient. But perhaps, if there was a predictive al algorithm that can tell the physician ten minutes earlier that the patient will go into a, a, a significant hypertensive state then they can, they can do more than just react. They can actually treat that patients and those products are on the market. And, and in, in that group as well, using these uh, new AI software and technology to come up with more predictive algorithms, I think is, is just incredibly exciting, especially and, and on, on our side. Uh, can you imagine if there was a wearable de uh, device or you can use your iPhone to diagnose a heart murmur, right? You don't have to make an appointment to to go and get an echo. There's some kind of early diagnosis that can be done that sends a signal to your primary care physician that perhaps there's something uh, that's not right. And and I think and I think that's what we all want as we grow older as well, right? I hate going to the hospital. I got to be honest with you. Uh, so if there's more diagnosis that can be done at home, and uh, you know what's just mind-boggling for me is how undertreated erotic stenosis, such a nasty disease where you die in two years if you don't get treated. And uh, 10 years ago, only six out of 10 uh, diagnosed patients were getting uh, an erotic valve replacement. And and now it's at 12, and our goal is to get it to 100%. So I, I, I just think there's a lot more to be done, but I do believe that in, in a very exciting and a very bright future for us. Fantastic. Matt, I uh, would love your perspective as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of a minute as I know we're getting close to time. I, I think we're going to see a fundamental change in medical devices and the practice of medicine in the next, I don't know, five to 10 years. It strikes me that at the moment we still practice cohort medicine. So essentially mm -hmm. we, we have a therapy for a group of patients and we apply that therapy to those patients. Now, that certainly improved the outcome. Uh, of patients but what we haven't truly got to is personalized medicine where with a degree of certainty we understand what the right therapy is for a particular patient given their genetics their risk factors and their lifestyle um, you mentioned it earlier Robert I, I think a combination of artificial intelligence with the large data sets um, that now registries are able to collect and we're able yeah. to mine from administrative databases. I think once we start combining understanding of devices with large data sets, with artificial intelligence, that we can truly start to give physicians the algorithms to prescribe therapies in a personalized manner. So I, yeah, I think we're gonna go from cohort practice medicine, which we practice today, to individualized algorithms and personalized medicine by adopting the big data and artificial intelligence technologies that are available there. So I think we've got a, a fundamental change coming in, in the next few years. That's fantastic. Uh, I, I agree uh, with a lot of what we shared. Uh, uh, it's a good group uh, of, of like-minded folks, it seems, from a bright future perspective. So uh, with our last couple of minutes, I am going to break out the old soapbox. 
uh, if anyone has something that you want the audience to know, right? Something you want the, the folks at home to take away in 30 seconds to a minute, uh, the, the floor will be yours. Uh, Matt, uh, would you mind kicking us off uh, on that if there's something you want to share? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to kick you off. And I, I guess I give you a perspective from a clinician who spent 30 years treating patients to someone who's now been purely in the medical device industry for eight or nine years. I, I firmly and unequivocally believe that the practice of medicine is improved when clinicians work in partnership with industry. Um, there's often a perceived or real conflict uh, between industry and clinicians, but with the technological advances that companies are now providing, I firmly believe that the way for us to drive medicine and the practice of medicine forward uh, is a symbiotic relationship between physicians and industry. And I think that's so key uh, to the future. Fantastic. Uh, Luxon, the floor is yours. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to close here with the patient's story. Our first Altera pulmonic patient treated at Cedar sinai She had open, multiple open heart surgeries, and it took her an entire month to get her courage up as she consented to be the very first patient because in her mind, she thought she was going to get open heart surgery. Procedure took an hour, and she, she I got a chance to meet her, and she told me that when she woke up in the recovery room, she saw the time on the clock, and she said she was so disappointed because she thought that she didn't get the Altera pre-stand because the procedure was so fast. Uh, it was done on a Friday. She went home on, on Saturday. And on Monday, she went to work. She was working at Disney's Imaginarium. And she said her best friend sitting next to her in the next cubicle said, Cheryl, I thought you were going to get your heart valve replaced, but what happened? Why didn't you get it? And she was like, no, 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 I really did. I did. I did get my heart valve. And, and her friend said, no, it looks like you got a lot of sun. You got sunburnt. You went to the beach in Hermosa Beach in Los Angeles. And she said, no, I, I just felt so good for the first time. In years, I went for a very long walk, and that's how I got sunburned. And this is the impact of these non-invasive surgeries. And I think both issue and Matt, you know, gave you additional examples of the most amazing products that they are that they, they and their teams are working as well. So, as we look at non-invasive products, they do make a huge impact to patients' lives. Awesome issue. Please uh, take us home. You bet. Um, I love that patient story, by the way. And I think that those are the things that internally keep all of us going. Um, I think that, you know, this is a, this is a super fun forum um, because it's progressive and it's progressive and not pie in the sky. It's, we thought of this great idea, we achieved it and now we're sharing it and now let's go to the next one kind of thing. And I think that's amazing. All of this amazing technology and these advancements don't mean anything if the patients can't get them. And we need to expand access to patients. We need to do that um, with um, identification, with um, overcoming reimbursement hurdles. And I think one of the things that I think of all the progress we've made, I think one thing that maybe we need to reevaluate is how guidelines uh, are developed and look. Um, in a lot of instances, guidelines end up being a coronation for a therapy, not really guiding practitioners on how to use newer therapies. And I think that um, part of expanding access, getting these therapies to patients is all of those things. Um, it's it's diagnosing them, making it available and, and, and making it, um, getting it paid for. Fantastic. Uh, gentlemen, Laxon, Ishu, Matt, thank you so much for the conversation today uh, and for the insights. It's been fantastic. Uh, I, I would like to just mention and remind our audience watching along at home that if they want to share this or review it, uh, the webcast will be available on the Gullion Foundation's homepage. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to just call out that uh, Thursday's Galyan Forum, uh, beginning at 7.30 a.m. Uh, and featuring a CEO roundtable uh, presentation of the 2023 Roy Vagelos uh, Pro Bono Humanum Award at 6.30 p.m. Uh, and immediately followed by the pre Galyan Awards Dinner at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, hopefully you got as much out of it as I did. Have a great afternoon.
Thanks, Scott. Thank you.